Hello, I'm Rick Halfelbauer. I'm excited to discuss with you in our webinar, Starting Your Own Vegetable Transplants. First of all, let's consider why you might want to do such a thing. Why would you consider growing your own vegetable transplants? Aren't there plenty available in nurseries during the spring of the year? Well, certainly there are. Any gardener knows that when you go to start your vegetable garden, there are some plants that generally we just buy as transplants. For example, tomatoes would be the most popular plant that are purchased um, as a transplant that we buy already started to put into our garden. However, uh, sometimes the particular variety of tomato or a particular variety of pepper, for example, or maybe watermelon, cantaloupe, may not be available at the local hardware store or nursery. So this is one good reason that you might want to consider growing your own transplants. You can select from the seeds that are available, uh, the type of plant, or I should say the variety, the particular variety that you would like, um, and you can purchase those seeds. You can sow those seeds at your leisure at home. You can time them in such a way also that you can be at the peak of your growing season. So for example, we'll talk in a minute about when to sow and how to sow seeds. One of the things that you want to consider is sowing them inside so that they're grown to the maturity that you want them to go out in the field just before, or I should say just after, the last frost in the spring. That allows your plants the maximum amount of time to reach maturity so that when they're bearing their fruit, uh, they're doing it at the peak of the season. In other words, you're not lagging, trying to get those uh, tomatoes or watermelon or whatever to come on and it's late into August or September and you're worried about frost. You have some control over when you put them in the ground. You have some control over their maturity and also some, to some degree uh, when they're actually going to fruit and bear for you. So those are just some of the reasons. I guess another reason that you might want to think about, although it doesn't happen often, but occasionally we will bring things in from somewhere else that someone else has grown. We put them into our garden and we begin to grow them and we find out that they have a disease. Or, or we find out that those transplants, um, maybe they've been sitting around for a long time and they're what I would consider not a very high quality transplant. They have difficulties. In other words, they're showing signs of stress. Maybe they're showing signs of uh, water stress, for example. Those are plants that you might not want to consider uh, growing in your garden because uh, with stress, they may actually reach their maturity um, when they're not really ready to do that. A good example would be, for example, um, lettuce. If you were to buy uh, a head lettuce like iceberg lettuce, uh, the plants were terribly stressed in the nursery. You bought them, brought them home, planted them. Now you put stress plants into your garden, and instead of growing and getting nice and leafy and green, those plants go immediately into a head, and now you've got a miniature head of lettuce that's of low quality. So these are just some reasons that you might want to consider growing your own uh, vegetable transplants. Now let's talk for a minute about the particular types of vegetables that you might want to consider growing from seed. Because not everything does particularly well being grown and then transplanted in the garden. We've already mentioned tomatoes. Tomatoes are a good example of a vegetable that we often buy as a transplant and put into our garden. Therefore, tomatoes as well as peppers and eggplant would all be good options not only to buy but to grow yourself. They're easy to grow at home and as mentioned before you can select the specific varieties that you want and you can time them for optimum planting time and you can control those things yourselves by growing those plants at home. Now broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage may also be purchased from seed and grown at home as well. Um, these are just a little bit more tricky. I mentioned um, lettuce may be going to head. Broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage are also plants that love the cool temperatures, but they don't like heat. So just be aware that if you grow these plants yourself, uh, head lettuce is one that we mentioned earlier, but broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage do this as well. If you grow them yourself and you let them get stressed by not enough water or too much heat, um, they can start to bolt, or in other words, go to seed as a very young plant. So still think about it. Consider growing broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage on your own, but realize it may be just a little bit tricky to do those. Again, though, for the same reasons that we grew the others, we might consider growing these as well. Melons. 
let's talk about growing melons for a minute. Now, when I see melons, I'm talking about all kinds. Uh, we're talking about cantaloupe. We're talking about watermelon. Uh, these are plants that need a lot of heat uh, to mature. Uh, and generally speaking, they take a long time. Watermelon and honeydew in particular can take 100, 120 days or so to mature. So getting back to that notion of um, you have control of when you actually start these plants. You have control of when you actually put them in the field. So melons are a very good example of something that you might want to consider starting seeds of, in, of your own uh, at home and then moving them out into the field. Because again, melons can be tricky for different reasons, not because they're going to go to seed on you or head early, but because they need that long growing season and they need that heat. So you could time these to be grown up to maturity so that they're ready to move out into the field again at the optimum time, as we mentioned before. Okay, we've talked about some things that would be good to grow from transplants. Let's look at a few things that maybe we would not want to consider growing first from a seed to transplant and then moving them outside. Beans would be a good example of a plant that you may not want to grow first. For one thing, um, we're first indoors and then moving outside. For one thing, beans are a relatively short season crop. Uh, most bean varieties take about 60 to 70 days to mature. So we're not really going to gain very much by growing them in terms of time. Uh, by growing them inside first. Uh, secondly, they don't necessarily transplant particularly easily. Um, and so green beans, there's no particular reason why you would want to grow those first and then move them outdoors. Uh, corn, I would say, would probably be for the same reason. Uh, corn, if you've noticed, once you do start to grow it, those young tender seedlings, if you go and disturb them very much, uh, you can stunt their growth. So they're not a, a plant that we generally think about as growing beforehand indoors and then moving them outside. Um, I have seen people uh, take corn and maybe pre-germinate it and get it up to a very small plant and grow it in a cell plaque and move it outside because the soil maybe was too cool to grow them outdoors. So that may be one reason you'd want to consider growing corn first as a transplant and then moving it out. Um, spinach, I would say, um, for similar reasons to the green beans. Uh, spinach like cool, they like cool weather. Um, I'm not sure you're really going to gain any advantage by growing them first as a transplant and then moving them outside. So spinach is one that I would recommend, again, direct seeding into the garden. Now let's talk for just a minute about root vegetables. Potatoes, uh, carrots, beets, for example. Uh, when we're growing root vegetables, Remember that um, if we're going to grow them inside first as a transplant, we do have to disturb that plant, take it outside, and get it restarted outdoors. Um, since the root part is the portion that we're actually growing for food, once we disturb that part, for example, a carrot root, once we disturb it to try to transplant it, um, it's going to be very difficult to plant that carrot root back out and keep it straight have it look nice, and have it not be stunted. So for the, those reasons, I would not recommend uh, growing root vegetables first as a transplant and then moving them outdoors. Here's a good example. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing you beets uh, in the foreground with uh, spinach back in the farther part of the slide here. You can see that in the slide, both the beets and the spinach are doing very well. These were direct seeded into the garden. Um, now, one thing that you will notice, these um, prior to the picture, these were hand thinned. And that's something that um, you will need to do, particularly if you direct sow them in the ground. Uh, generally, we sow them a little thicker than maybe they should, just oftentimes because we want to make sure that we're going to get a good stand. And that does require that we go back two, couple, two, three weeks later after they're up and we hand thin. This is a nice stand of beets, and it's a very nice stand of spinach that were direct seeded in the garden rather than first grown as a transplant. Okay, let's talk now about what types of equipment I would need to grow my own transplants. Certainly, you'd want your own potting soil. A heating mat, we'll get to what a heating mat is and why you might want to use one. Lights are very, very important. Um, 
Natural light from the sky, even in a well-lit window, is not going to be adequate for growing transplants. Trays, I'm going to show you some good examples of both starting uh, seed trays and finishing trays. A timer is not essential, but certainly it's a good help for you in terms of being able to control when the light comes on and when it comes off on your transplants. Then we're going to need some type of fertilizer, and certainly let's not forget the vegetable seeds that we want to grow. Potting soil. My first recommendation to you is I would strongly suggest that you not use field soil or garden soil. I can tell you firsthand that I've tried this myself. When you bring in outdoor soil, you put it inside into containers in a nice warm environment and you moisten it, you are very likely to bring with it fungus disease problems and insects. And when we expose them to those nice, cushy, warm conditions, they tend to hatch out and then we start off with problems right off the bat. So I really recommend that you buy a good quality high grade topsoil or what we would call a potting soil or potting medium. Sometimes we call these soilless mixes because they actually don't have any outdoor soil included. These will be largely uh, peat moss and compost based growing mediums. There are many types on the market. I would just say get a good quality one that um, uh, has an, a nice growing texture to it. You don't want it to be too coarse of a texture. You don't want there to be lots of large clods or pebbles or rocks because that's going to interfere with germination of your young seedlings. Well, enough about potting soil. Let's talk for a minute about a heating mat. Heating mats are something, again, it's, they are not absolutely essential, but I would recommend that you consider getting a heating mat. Basically what we do is we take the heating mat and we slip it underneath of our starting uh, tray with our seeds and soil. And what this will do is this will keep those um, seedlings or those seeds at an optimum temperature uh, as they begin to germinate. This will accelerate your germination. Usually cut the time I have found in half. For example, if it takes seven days to germinate seeds, of a particular vegetable, you'll cut that down to about three to four days by using a heat mat. Um, the other thing that the heat mat will do is it will help your vegetables to be more uniform. So in other words, we don't have some germinating today, some germinating two, three, four days later, and some germinating even two or three days after that. What that does is it gives us an uneven stand of seedlings that become more difficult to work with. So I would strongly recommend that you consider purchasing a heating mat and using it for germination. Let's talk about light. I mentioned earlier that generally outdoor lighting is not sufficient for starting transplants. Again, this is one of those lessons I learned early many years ago as I was trying to start my own vegetable plants. I would get the seedlings started. I would set them into a well-lit window and I noticed that those seedlings every time would start to lean over toward the sunlit window. So what would I do? I would turn the seedling tray around and I would try to get those seedlings to straighten up and of course what did they do? They straighten up and they lean toward the window again. Now although in, in theory that seems like a good idea, the other thing that we tend to do when we continue to move those seedlings around and get them to kind of chase the sun so to speak is those seedlings will tend to be quite leggy. By leggy, we mean that the seedling gets elongated to the point where it actually wants to fall over. So the best way to prevent legginess in your seedlings is to get yourself a good artificial light. I recommend just a plain old ordinary shop light that you can purchase at most any hardware store. The ones that I'm showing you on the slide, the one is a professional lighting tray that you can see that has a stand with the light attached. Um, these are great. Uh, they work very well. Could be a little on the pricey side for a home grower. You may not need that. Uh, you could simply just purchase the shop light itself without all the other equipment. You can take that shop light and you can hang it by a chain or by a rope and just make sure that you're um, hanging that in such a way that you can elevate the light up and down and adjust it according to the height of your seedlings. Um, you do want these to be cool bulbs like fluorescent bulbs like I'm showing you in this one slide 
where I've turned those lights on so that you can see them illuminating. Um, that's what you want. You don't want necessarily an incandescent light bulb. Those do give off a fair amount of light, but they also produce a tremendous amount of heat. And by the time you get that incandescent light bulb close enough to the young transplants, you're going to dry them out and possibly heat damage them as well. So a cool light fluorescent bulb is what you want for your artificial light to get your transplants off to a good start. Okay, another thing that you want to consider is a timer. Now I mentioned before it's not absolutely necessary. You can certainly turn your lights on and off each day, but by um, adding to your um, seedling trays a timer that goes between the light switch and the outlet, uh, you can set this for the proper amount of light that you need. And generally young seedlings are going to need to have the light on about 14 to 16 hours. So that means without a timer, you're going to need to turn it off on in the morning and then let that light stay on all day and then come back sometime later in the evening and make sure that you switch it off. So approximately 14 to 16 hours of light is necessary. So the timer just will save you from having to make sure that you are home both morning and evening to make sure you turn the lights on and off at the appropriate time each day. Some people will ask me, um, you know, where do you buy your seeds or where can I get good garden seeds? And you know, I've actually found that most places that I shop, um, both online as well as in garden centers and hardware stores, carry a wide selection of very good high quality seeds. Um, usually if a seed packet is old, it will tell you on the back of the package or somewhere stamped on the package a date that those package or that those seeds were packaged for. In other words, a particular year or growing season that they were packaged for. So my only caution really is that when you're purchasing seeds, make sure that you're getting some that are packaged for the year that you want to grow them in. Um, and if they're a year old, that's okay. Just realize that they may lose um, some of their germination rate. For example, they may have been a 90% germination rate the first year. They may drop to, say, 80 or 85 the second year. So you just may have to plant a few more of them to get as many plants as you want out of that particular seed packet. Now, sometimes, as I mentioned before, one of the reasons we may want to grow um, our own vegetable transplants is because we're oftentimes um, looking or we're concerned about trying to um, grow something that we may not be able to find just anywhere. And so uh, what I often do is I'll go online and I'll shop for a specific vegetable plant or seed variety that I'm looking for. And um, this is where the internet's wonderful because you can go on, you can put in a particular vegetable uh, varietal name that you're looking for and then search it and a lot of times a number of different seed companies will come out up online and tell you um, who's carrying those particular varieties. So I would recommend that you shop around, find the varieties that you want to grow. I'm sure you'll be able to find them with all the different um, seed companies that now are available to us. Okay, I mentioned about the germination date and so I've given you a close-up shot of a seed packet and you can see right here this particular package of hybrid bell peppers. Uh, these are green peppers going to full red color when they're at maturity. These have a germination rate of 86 percent which is pretty good. They were packaged for uh, January of 2013. So you see how you can read your package there. Now the other one that I'm showing you in this slide um, also is specific instructions on how to grow a specific type of vegetable plant. In this case, it's tomatoes. So it even tells you in this case to allow six to eight weeks grown inside prior to planting outside. Um, it tells you how deep to cover them, one sixteenth to one quarter inch. It even tells you what temperature to maintain them at. So I strongly recommend that you follow the growing guidelines that are provided to you on the seed packages. Let's talk about trays for a minute. Now I've given you two different types of trays here. The one that has the long slots is what I call a starting tray. Um, this starting tray basically is so that we can put soil into those slots and we can grow many seeds at one time. The other tray that I'm showing you is sometimes what's called a, uh, a cell pack, for example, or tray pack. 
So once we've grown in the, in the long slotted starter seed slots, we grow those seedlings up and then we transfer them from that starter tray to the other one, which is a cell pack. The cell pack is giving it more rooting area uh, in order for it to achieve the size that we want before we move them out into the field. Um, again, these are just things that I recommend to you. They're easy to find again online or even at a hardware store for that matter. You need to have uh, or be prepared to water and fertilize your transplants. Now you'll notice that in this picture I put a picture of a spray bottle. The reason that I like a spray bottle for watering is because it's very gentle. I can take that spray bottle and I can water those tiny seedlings and by using the spray bottle I don't disturb them. Also you want to think about a good liquid fertilizer. Again there are many on the market but by um, once those plants are up um, I'll say a couple inches, two or three inches. At that point in time, you'll want to lightly start to fertilize them. And so the best way to do that is to add a liquid fertilizer to your, your uh, irrigation water and fertilize them that way. Well, I often get asked, do I need to have a greenhouse or do I need to have a specialized structure like this beautiful one that I put in this picture in order to start your own seedlings? And the answer is no. If you have one, wonderful, use it, enjoy it, but you don't need to have one just to start your own vegetable transplants. So where do I want to grow my vegetable transplants? Well, basically here's the requirements. You want a place where you can maintain a consistent temperature. That's going to be critical. Not too drafty, not too cold, not too hot. Also, where there is adequate light. And we've talked about the importance of adequate lighting. So you'll want a place where you can hang those shop lights that we talked about and be able to adjust them. You also are going to want to keep those seedlings moist but not waterlogged. So generally you want to grow indoors where you have control of the environment. Now, this picture I've, I'm showing you here is of uh, that starting tray that I used earlier, or showed you a picture of earlier. You see that I've already put this, uh, the medium, the growing medium into that tray, and I have just started to add the seeds on the top there of the soil. So we want to carefully sow seeds into a very fine growing media. You'll see this is very, very fine soil. It's not clumpy. When we first apply the seeds to the soil, we want them about a half inch apart. And then we want to press them lightly into the soil, or we want to sprinkle just a very light amount of soil on top. If we cover these seeds too deeply, these happen to be tomato seeds in the picture. Um, all of the small seeded vegetables, if they're covered too deeply, they're not going to co come up. So we want to make sure that we just lightly cover them, and then we water them right after we plant them. The other thing I'd strongly encourage you to do is while you have the seed packets right there and you know which ones are which varieties, you'll want to mark them. And something that I learned by, uh, again, by <laughs> my own experiences, if you think that you will remember, if you're like me, you may not remember as long as I, as you think that you will, which varieties you planted in which particular slots. And so then later on when you go to plant them out, you can't remember which tomato was which in the, in the seed tra uh, tray. So what I do is I would, and I would encourage you to do this, is to simply take some masking tape, apply it to the tray, and then use a Sharpie and write on there which variety of tomato, for example, or which variety of pepper are in those slots, so that when you go to move them out in the field, you know exactly which varieties you're moving. Okay, what is what are the optimum germination conditions? Well, during germination, generally speaking, you want to maintain temperatures at about 70 to 80 degrees. A heating mat, as I mentioned, will help you achieve this. Using a cover will also ensure a constant temperature and it will also help you keep high humidity. Now, once you see the seedlings start to emerge from the soil, you want to remove that cover, okay? Because if you leave the cover on too long, the seedlings will really stretch for light and also too much moisture may also encourage the seedlings to rot. If you've been using a heating mat, once the seedlings emerge, then it's time to turn that heat mat off. Continue to cover and heat the soil after germination, though, will cause the seedlings to be leggy, like we discussed before, and they may also fall over. 
So here's some optimum growing temperatures for different vegetables. Tomatoes and peppers, optimum temperatures during the day would be 65 to 80. During the night, 60 to 70 degrees. With melons, cucumbers, and squash, optimum day temperatures would be 70 to 80 degrees, with nighttime temperatures around 60 to 70. Broccoli, cauliflower, uh, cabbage, those types of plants are cool crops, or what we sometimes call cold crops or brassicas. They actually can require less heat, so their daytime temperatures are 60 to 70, with nighttime temperatures around 50 to 60 degrees. Spinach, chards, uh, chards and lettuce, daytime temperatures are even cooler yet at 55 to 75, and nighttime temperatures around 45 to 55. Now, if you do decide to grow onions from seed, here's the optimum temperatures for those, around 60 to 70 degrees during the day and 45 to 55 at night. Hardening transplants. Basically, when we talk about hardening seedlings, we're simply preparing them for uh, being moved outdoors, okay? Um, why would we want to do this? Well, the, the obvious reason is, if you think about it, uh, if, as your seedlings have been growing indoors under what we've considered to be just optimum conditions of light, humidity, moisture, you've taken good care of them, but you've also pampered them a bit. We need to begin to expose them to the outside conditions. So how do we do it? Basically, we're going to give them a controlled exposure, okay? And how long does it take to do this? Well, it takes usually about a week, okay? And what you're going to want to do is begin to expose them to some outdoor conditions, to a little bit of wind, to a little bit of cool temperature, and to just a little bit less water, okay? And if you do that, and you do it gradually for about a week, then your plants will begin to adjust to those conditions and they won't have such a difficult time going through what we call transplant shock when you move them outdoors. Um, now, sometimes people will say, I just don't have time to do that. I need to get the plants out. I didn't think about harding them off. What do I do? Well, then basically what you're going to want to do is move those out when the conditions outdoors have reached um, what would be the optimum for those particular plants that you have to put out for those particular vegetables, and then you may want to cover them at night with some type of cover, or you may want to cover them also when it's windy. This will help uh, them get used to those conditions without being overly exposed to them all at one time. Let's talk for a minute about moving your transplants. When I say moving, uh, remember I talked about the seed starter tray, which is where we see those young green plants growing. Um, in the upper corner of the slide here. Uh, these are just about ready now to be moved from the starter tray to the cell pack. Sometimes these are called six packs. These don't have six cells in them, so I am not calling them cell pack or six packs, but basically this, this is a cell tray. In other words, this is where we're now going to move the young seedlings in, give them their own rooting space, and we're going to finish them out. So we have a starter tray and we have a finishing tray. Now I've also shown you what some homeowners have done, and I've done this myself at times, and that is I've moved those young seedlings into Dixie cups, little small paper cups. They work well too. The only caution I'd give you is most of these paper Dixie cups, um, when they are exposed to a lot of water and sunlight, they deteriorate fairly rapidly. So just be prepared if they start to fall apart to go ahead and move them out into the garden quickly. Let me show you something in the middle of this slide that is um, highlighted by my red circle here. What I'm trying to show you is that there is a time when these young seedlings are ready to move from the starter tray to the finishing tray, and that is when they've developed their own true leaves. So you'll notice in this uh, circular area, we've got some very, very small rounded leaves, and then just above the rounded leaves, we have what we call the true leaves. Well, you want to see about uh, at least two and preferably four true leaves on each of those seedlings, before we move them from the starter tray to the finishing tray. So another question we should address is, how do I know when my transplants are ready to plant in the field? One of the ways that you can tell is if you look at the transplant that I have pulled out and set up on top here, uh, you'll see that within that rooting media, we have about 50% soil and about 50% white roots. That's a really good indicator that that plant 
has done what it needs to do in order to hold on to that soil and have a good sturdy root system when we move it to the field. The other plant that I'm showing you in this slide is a melon plant. I'm just pulling it out of the seed tray and you'll notice that there's almost no root showing in that rooting media. That seedling is weak, it's not ready to go outside, and it's not going to transplant very well. So I hope you can see from these two different examples that I have, one a plant that's ready to move, be moved to the field and one that is not. Now, how much time do I allow from sowing inside to planting out in the field? These are some general guidelines I'm giving you here, but you can also get the same information from your seed package. Generally speaking, if you choose to grow lettuce indoors, and again, you might do this with head lettuce, allow three to four weeks from the time you sow seeds indoors until they're ready to go out into the field. With melons, about four to five weeks. With tomatoes, about five to six weeks. And with peppers, it will require about six to eight weeks from the time you sow them indoors until they're ready to be moved outside. So I often ask myself, can you count backwards? In other words, I look and I say, okay, when would I like to put these plants out into the field? And then I count backwards, six to eight weeks for peppers, and that's when I want to be sowing indoors in order to be prepared to move them out into the field. Now, when you move them to the field, if conditions are not exactly optimal, we talked about covering them. And this you might want to do, particularly if it's a little bit on the cool side, it's a little on the windy side, or if you have plants that maybe are just slightly undersized, um, you can use a hot cap, as I've shown you on the one slide. You can also use something that we call a row cover, which is simply a very lightweight row cover made out of a material called Rime. And that row cover can be draped directly over the plant, or as I have showed you in the one slide, we've made simple hoops out of one half inch PVC pipe. And we've used that, those to support the row cover and keep it from laying directly on the plants. Now these lightweight row covers, until it gets quite warm outside, you can leave them on both day and night. But once temperatures approach probably 80 degrees or so, you may want to remove them during the day and put them on at night. That will keep them from overheating inside the, the cover. Final topic I'd like to cover with you is seed storage. So now that you're going to become experts at starting your own seeds indoors and planting them outside, you're going to end up with extra seeds some that you don't use from year to year. What I'd strongly recommend is that you get yourself a plastic container that has a lid that is airtight or nearly airtight, um, something like a Tupperware container, so to speak, where you can get a snap lid and put on there, store your seeds in that container, apply the lid to them when they're not being used, and then put them in a cool, dry location. You can keep your seeds for many years that way if you keep them in the right conditions. Let's go back to this particular slide. I wanted to make sure that I showed you some of our bulletins that are available. Uh, these are available online uh, for you. And um, if you simply go to um, extension.usu.edu, you can search for any of our publications. In particular, I've given you the URL for two. Uh, one that is Grow Your Own Transplants at Home, and the other one is Vegetable Transplant Production. So all of the information that I've covered with you today would be found in both of those bulletins. Well, thanks for watching. Um, happy gardening. And remember, one of the keys to successful gardening is to always keep records on what you grow so that when next year comes around, you'll be able to apply the past year's experience to your new garden. Happy gardening.